Welcome to the Vet Me Rehabilitation Podcast, where we aim to help fellow Vet Me Rehab therapists increase their knowledge and elevate their practice. I'm Megan Kelly. And I'm Anne Lloyd. Together, we bring you the latest insights, research, and information in the field of veterinary rehabilitation. This podcast is brought to you by Online Pet Health, a leading continued education membership for veterinary rehabilitation therapists. With Online Pet Health, you will have access to a wide range of online resources to help you stay up to date with the latest techniques, advances, and trends in the industry. Our podcast features in-depth conversations with leading experts in veterinary rehabilitation. They share their own experiences and knowledge to help you improve your practice. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just starting out in the field, our goal is to provide you with the tools and the insights you need to succeed. So join us as we explore the exciting world of vet knee rehabilitation and help you take your practice to the next level. Hey Vet Rehabbers, happy Valentine's Day everyone. This is not a day my hubby and I celebrate. In his words, every day is Valentine's Day in our household. It pretty much is true. He spoils me virtually every single week with flowers and gifts of appreciation. So to those of you that are celebrating a happy Valentine's Day today, we are two weeks into our birthday month and we are gifting you, the Vet Rehabber community, two free webinars this month. For our non-members, you can go to onlinepetalt.com forward slash gift to access them. And for our members, you will notice they will be added into your membership as a bonus. Now the webinars are the Grayston Technique. This is an instrument assisted soft tissue mobilization. And basically how it works is you utilize a medical grade stainless steel instrument and this amplifies the feelings of palpation and expands the power of your hands as you work to identify any soft tissue irregularities. This is going to be focused on the equine and it is sponsored by Grayston Technique. And then our second webinar is sponsored by the Canine Rehab Institute and is lectured by their very own Cara Amsterd. This is a great refresher, radiology tips for the veterinary rehabilitation therapist. So you can sign up at onlinepetshealth.com forward slash gift. Now, checking how things are going in your business is really important. It's like having a roadmap to make smart decisions and plans. So measuring metrics means looking at numbers that tell you how well your practice or business is doing. It helps spot what's going well, where you can do better, and what goals you're hitting. These numbers also act like an early warning system, so you can quickly adjust to any changes in the market or changes that things that are happening actually in your business. Whether it's keeping customers happy or making things run smoother, metrics help you figure out where to focus and how to keep getting better. So measuring met- metrics isn't just about numbers, it's about like having a guide to make sure your business grows and stays successful successful and for you to be on top of it and aware of it. Fran Meyer from the Canine PT Academy discusses today the metrics that you need to record in your vet rehab business. So over to Fran. Thank you Megan Kelly and the online pet health team once again for another opportunity to be teaching you guys some of the business training. So today we're going to be trying to take a topic that most can I have therapists find a little bit boring and try to at least give some light into why that is important and what you need to be tracking? We're going to be talking about metrics you need to record in your business, okay? And I broke that down into four different categories and I'm going to uh, uh, break down one by one and also explaining each one of the types of metrics within each category. And then also I'm going to do some screen sharing to hopefully try to... Uh, show it to you guys how uh, I track and how I teach some of my mentees to kind of like be tracking some of these metrics on their own as well, okay? So the first category we're gonna be talking about are the finance metrics, okay? Um, Most of this ones is gonna be very easy for you to take from whatever like a, a bookkeeping software you use. If you use something like QuickBooks, Xerox, Wave, or whatever it may be, that can kind of like easily kind of like uh, uh, give you some of this report, okay? And some of them should be fairly straightforward, right? So we're talking about total revenue, we're talking about total expenses, and we're talking about profit, 
Okay. Now, the important thing to keep in mind as well is uh, you want to be tracking those three things in particular, and we're going to be talking about the fourth one in a little bit. But we want to be talking. We, you want to be tracking those three things in particular, not just on a monthly basis, but also on a quarterly and then, of course, annual basis. And the reason why that's important is because so you can compare apples to apples. Okay. Uh, a lot of businesses have seasonality some business more than the other. Sometimes that seasonality can be connected to the geographical location there you're at, right? So if you live in an area, let's say here in the United States, for example, if you have a clinic down in a place in Florida where it's warmer and we have a lot of people during the winter months when it gets colder that they move down to Florida for four to six months or so between the holidays and Easter, then that can be your, your high season. And then it kind of like, Slows down a little bit afterwards. So you have sometimes the geographical seasonalities, but then you have the seasonalities just that are going to happen throughout the year, where, for example, the holidays can be a slower period of time, you know, kind of stuff too. So it's kind of nice for you to be able to compare not just in a month to month basis, but then going back and comparing to the same time period for the previous year. And then once you have that data for multiple years, looking at a trend over, let's say, uh, the third quarter of the year over the last four years? What has been the trend that you've been seeing over that period of time, quarter by quarter, over the same time period of the year? And that's gonna allow you to, to, to have a much better understanding about the business, okay? So total revenue, pretty simple, amount of money that you have generated through the business, total expenses as well, pretty simple, the total expenses that you have generated through the business. And then we have profit. Now, one note that I put over there to keep in mind is, are we talking about profit before or after the owner's compensation, okay? Because that can kind of like skew the numbers a little bit. And honestly, I like keeping an eye on both. Usually, the profit that you're going to get from your accountant is going to be usually uh, 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 be before owner's compensation. Now, there are other factors tied up into it because they're looking at profit from a tax perspective, right? And we're always trying to decrease the amount of tax that we have to pay by decreasing our uh, adjusted growth income kind of stuff. So there's a lot more variables that go into it. So I try to keep it, you know, fairly, fairly simple. So let me show it to you guys what is that I kind of like mean by it. So this is a, a spreadsheet. Let me zoom in just a little bit. So this is a, a spreadsheet template, okay, that I use for uh, uh, our students, use for my business myself as well. So you can kind of see over here, and this is a blank one, because then, you know, they're able to input whatever services, whatever revenue they kind of have here, just for rehab and the water treadmill and acupuncture. But if you sell products, if you have other services, whatever it may be, and there's a column where they put the plan, right? So that's important thing to mention as well. You want to have a goal of what it is that you're trying to hit, right? So you want to have the plan and you want to have the actual. You go back at the end of the month and what was the actual that you meet, right? So you can have your plan of $10,000 in revenue and then, you know, your actual was 9,000, you know? And then you can kind of see that we structure also by quarter. So you can kind of see that it filled out this gray columns over here with the quarter, quarter as well. So let's say in February, your goal uh, um, is $12,000 and then your actual was 10,500. So it gets filled over there and then 13,000 here and then you went above, right? So you can kind of see that it fills out here for the quarter as well. And if I scroll all the way to the side, it's going to give me the annual as well, along with a gap in terms of am I uh, uh, above or below that target that I had set within like your budget kind of stuff. And then you put it over here, your operating costs. You know, I'm not going to go through that right now, but same thing, target and actual for your operating costs. But then I'm just going to put like a, uh, like it's not going to make much sense just for just example purpose. I'm going to put a $7,000 here and let's say our per rating was 8,000. So you can kind of see here, then it's going to take on this first dark row on the bottom is your net profit. So that's the profit before your owner's compensation. All it took was that 9,000 revenue they generated minus $8,000 of your expenses. 
and your net profit is a thousand, right? That's just one example. Now, that's a bad example because it, I would assume if you only have a thousand dollars of profit in this instance, that would include your salary over there, which personally I like to keep the business owner compensation and benefits and stuff separately. So let's change just slightly over here. Let's say it was $4,000 in expense and then owner benefits, which this category you can also change is another $4,000. Let's say you pay $4,000 a month. So now, well, let's choose a different number just to not be equal. But then now what it does over here is change to that $5,000 was a net operating profit but then your net profit, uh, well, I guess the formula got messed up a little bit. The net profit should have oh, gone down there. Sorry. See, sometimes when you're doing this live, you, you ended up catching that mistake there. <laughs> there you go. Actually, it should be minus. All right, let's fix that just for so you guys can understand. There you go. So now we took the owner's compensation. So the true net profit of the business is going to be different than the operating profit because the operating profit was before I pay myself. Now the true net profit is after I pay myself, which went from $5,000 profit to $1,500 profit. So hopefully that makes sense. And then we do the same thing like I, do, I, I did it above month by month, quarter by quarter, and get that bigger picture for the whole year kind of stuff. So yes, is it fun to do this? It's just a lot of data entering kind of stuff. But when you have that information over a long period of time, it's going to give you super valuable information for you and for your business, okay? And then the other thing you want to be looking at is payroll percentage in terms of revenue, okay? And there is no benchmarks in the field of Canada you have in terms of like, as we grow our business, how much of the percentage of revenue should we budget for payroll? You know, there are benchmarks in veterinary medicine, there is benchmark in physical therapy clinics and so forth. And I feel probably our benchmarks should be a little bit closer to what it is in physical therapy rather than veterinary medicine because veterinary medicine uh, generates a lot of revenue from other sources of income like exams, diagnostic tests, uh, blood work, surgery, uh, a lot more uh, over-the-counter products that get sold, pharmacy, you know, there's a lot of stuff that goes into it, into cost of goods, inventory kind of stuff. So, you know, usually I think payroll percentage, which is basically dividing like how much you're paying per payroll divided by uh, uh, what's your total revenue, you're going to be at a healthy spot with a canine rehab clinic, depending on the size of your staff, of course, and how much involved you, the business owner, is with the business. At somewhere between like 40 to 60 percent i think a healthy spot is 45 to 55 percent if you get true low it's also not good because yes you're technically making more profit but if you have staff then you could mean that you are underpaying your staff and and, and you could lead into high turnover kind of stuff of course if you are a solopreneur too at this point you know it can it can the numbers are going to look very different so i'm taking into account those of us who have like staff on payroll and that kind of stuff anything 45 to 55 percent very sustainable when you start getting close to 60 percent you're still at a good spot but it's going to start cutting into the profit margin for sure so you just need to kind of like be aware of it 60 to 70 percent can be doable for a period of time while you're growing while maybe you added more staff before you see an increasing revenue kind of stuff uh, but it's very hard to sustain that business in the long run with anything at like 65% or above, because then it's basically going to be cutting, you know, into your profit as the business owner as well, which, you know, then what's the point of running the business and dealing with everything if we're not, you know, taking care of ourselves as well. So hopefully in terms of metrics from a financial perspective, this kind of numbers, you know, do make sense. So then let's talk about key performance indicators or KPIs, okay? And you might have heard this uh, get said before, which is what gets measured gets done, right? And that's why it's important to measure how the business is doing. And it's an essential, like, just management operational tool. And it's going to help us determine if the work that you're doing, if the business that you're running, you know, it's actually sustainable, if it's being efficient, if it's running the right way, right? And KPIs are going to be key in kind of like quantifying kind of like how the business is doing and how it's progressing towards its goals, okay? It also helps you see where the holes are in the business. It helps you figure out where 
you should focus some of your energy, some of your strategy, some of your operational stuff to try to fix some of the holes, to making sure that you know things are working in congruency and everything is working as well as it, uh, it should be. So it, it becomes a big part of the decision making process when you're trying to figure it out. What's going to be your plan for this quarter? What's going to be your plan for the next six months? What's going to be your plan for next year? Okay. And then, of course, setting targets that are going to be used to, to measure that, right? So you can't just be measuring for the sake of measurement, but you also need to be setting targets to know how we're doing in terms of that, okay? And here I put some of the key performance indicators that I feel are very important for us in the field to be tracking. Some of those are going to be pretty straightforward, right? Total number of visits. So usually uh, uh, what I should say also, like we're tracking this monthly. So it's a good, uh, the KPI is very good to track monthly kind of stuff. So total visits for the month. How many visits in total you had within your business? New evaluations for the month. How many new evaluations did you have for the business? Then we start getting into more of the percentages where it's going to tell us how efficient uh, um, different roles in the business are, you know, in terms of their performance kind of stuff, right? So, of course, an evaluation to a package or plan of care, depending on how you structure that within your business, but in, let's say an evaluation to plan of care conversion. So, meaning for every 10 new evaluations that you do, how many of those evaluations actually then go uh, and start a plan of care afterwards and it's never going to be a hundred percent of course because there's always going to be some clients some patients that are going to come for an evaluation and then afterwards for one reason or the other decide to not kind of like follow through i feel you know probably somewhere between 75 percent to 80 percent is a healthy target goal so let's say 75 percent but that would mean that for every four new patients in the evaluations that you're doing three of them should be converting into a plan of care Right, so it leaves some room where we know that not everyone's going to be converted. So this is a good measurement of performance for your clinical providers, for your therapists, for your DVMs, for your rehab techs, or whoever those might be. Um, then we started looking at cancellation percentage, right? So cancellation percentage, pretty straightforward, is out of the total number of appointments for that period of time for that month, uh, 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 divide from that the number of sessions that got canceled, that's a cancellation percentage. Now the cancellation percentage is a, it's more of like a team performance because it's not just one role that it's really in charge of that. Uh, but for the majority of time, it is a good measurement of uh, uh, the role of like your front desk administrative role that is gonna try to make sure that people are kind of like staying on the schedule. But of course your therapists, your clinical providers can play a significant part on that as well. Uh, personally, I like those to be in the single digits. So as long as you can keep it those below 10%, I think that's a healthy number. Of course, cancellations are going to happen for good reasons. But if you start getting high into the teens, if you start getting to 20% cancellation, then that starts having a, a, a really negative impact on your bottom line at the end of the month, right? Because let's say, you know, your clinic sees 200 appointments a month, right? Your clinic is 200 per month, you're getting a 20% cancel rate. That's 40 appointments that you're missing. Now, we don't expect the cancel rate to be a 0%, but even if you decrease that by half, by 20 appointments, and just for the sake of keeping math simple, you charge $100 per session, that's $2,000 right there that you were able to recuperate by decreasing your cancel rate from 20 to 10%. So hopefully that kind of like makes uh, uh, sense. Then the next one is the completed plan of care percentage, right? So that's also gonna be a measurement for the most part of uh, the role of your clinical provider on how well they're doing on making sure that people are sticking with their plan of care, seeing through the whole plan of care and not dropping off, okay? And it comes a lot to the education and the value of like, even when the patients start doing better, to show it to them how important it is to continue with things and not encounter a lot of those scenarios where, oh, well, my dog is feeling better. So I'm just going to kind of like stop this right now and continue doing things at home. Okay. So completed plan of care percentage should be very high because once they committed to a plan of care, we do want to see them through. It's not only good for the business, but it's better for the patient, for the pet owner as well, of course, right? Because then they're going to get what they're actually looking for. They're going to get the long-term outcome that they're actually looking for. Uh, 
So I like to have that at the at the very least at ninety percent. There are going to be circumstances where people are going to drop off, and that can happen. So I think it's going it's you know some months could be at a hundred percent, but I think when you're looking at a whole twelve month period, it's very hard to be at a hundred percent. But I feel ninety percent is a good measurement rate for you on the complete plan of care percentage. And then the last one is the rehab to wellness percentage. So those would be for you clinic owners who have some sort of like wellness program that people, once they finish their rehab program with their pets, they can kind of like graduate towards so they can continue working with you on a regular basis. So, you know, many different ways to structure the wellness program per se, but we do want to track. Like if you have that available for people, you do want to track, okay, how many of this, how many of this, uh, patients that are completing their plan of care are converting into our wellness program okay and i think a good number right there is probably about 40 to 45 percent right so about half because if our goal was 90 percent of those patients that start after the eval and, and convert to a plan of care for them to complete the plan of care at the end right if the goal is 90 percent 40 to 45 percent will put us like a half so half of our patients that complete their plan of care are ideally then converting to that wellness, right? And that that last number, that's the one that can vary so much depending on how you structure your, your business kind of stuff. But if you do have a wellness program, I think it's going to be uh, very helpful for you to track that number so you know uh, uh, how efficient the program is being, but then also how well your therapists are doing in terms of showing people the value of continue working with you in the long run. Because the benefit of keeping people within your circle is that not only is going to benefit, of course, the, the patients, the clients themselves, because they're going to then be more proactive about things. They're going to be, be, be on top of things. But from a business perspective, it's going to generate recurring revenue and it's going to keep people around your circle. You know, so that way, if there is a setback with that patient, they're going to be more likely to get back on the schedule and maybe do another uh, 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 plan of care, another package, if they have been seeing you for that period of time, right? So very important component, very, you know, something to think about it if you don't have some sort of like wellness program established in your business yet. Then from KPIs, we're going to go to critical drivers, okay? And the best way I can kind of like explain a little bit of how I define the difference between KPIs is that KPIs help make sure your business is on target and it's going the right way and, and, and hitting the goals that you want to hit, where critical drivers are going to help drive the growth and the sustainability of the business. Okay. So that's how I, I, I look a little bit of like them a little bit different, although there's still metrics, they still fall all within the same umbrella of like metrics that you're tracking for your business. Okay. So the first one that I feel is important to track is your average patient spend. So what that means is on average, for every new patient that you get, how much in total through their plan of care they're spending with you, okay? And this is the, uh, I just did a simple math example there for you to see, so let, for you to like observe. So let's say you had, you know, uh, this particular month, you have this three patients that have completed, graduated from rehab kind of stuff. So you take those three patients and you look back, okay, how much did they spend with us? So let's say Buddy spent $1,500, Bella spent $2,500, and Max spent $500. So you add those three together, you get $4,500. And then you divide it by three, or uh, 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 there's a type over there, 4,500 divided by three, not 4,000 divided by three, 4,500 divided by three, you get $1,500 average patient spend, right? Now, in a nutshell, in a vacuum, that number doesn't mean much. But when you look at bigger data sets, when you look at over a 12-month period, over a six-month period and more, then suddenly you start getting like very good idea on how much each new patient uh, is valuable to your business, right? And let's say the scenario is just that, that for every new patient that you get, it, it, it costs you $1,500, it, you earn $1,500 in revenue. And then suddenly it starts playing a factor into you deciding how to allocate some of your marketing budget, right? Let's say, for example, you decide to spend uh, $500 uh, um, a month on Google Ads, Right. So then you know that if you get one patient that comes from a Google ad campaign, not only you paid for the five hundred dollars, but you have an extra thousand dollars. Or let's say you have a community event that 
between uh, the fee to be at the community events and the, 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 the marketing cost and everything is going to cost you $1,000, for example, right? Then you know, okay, if I get one patient to come from this community events, then I'm more than paid for it as well. So it starts allowing you to make some of like critical decisions in terms of marketing strategy as well. Once you know what's the value of each patient to you, that's why that number is important. The second one is the PVA or patient visit average, which is going to tie up very closely as well to the average patient span. Of course, all these numbers kind of like do have some correlation together. And I'm going to show more of that example in a little bit on the spreadsheet. But patient visit average is looking at a time period. You look at the total number of sessions that you have and you divide by the total number of patients. So let's say in a particular month, you had 105 total sessions and you had 35 patients. So you take one five, 105 divided by 35, and that's three. So that means that on average, each patient saw you three times for that month. Does that make sense? So of course, that's going to vary a lot depending on your business model and how often you see patients. Clinics that tend to see patients twice a week, then that PVA should be higher, should be six, seven, eight plus kind of stuff. Clinics that don't see their patients as frequently, that number is going to be lower, maybe around three or four kind of stuff, right? So that's going to tie up a lot to the business model itself, but it's going to allow you to keep track of the business in terms of making sure that uh, 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 patients are getting on the schedule, right? Because then if, you're, if, you're, if your goal is, let's say, six, right? If your goal is six for the month, for every patient on average, they see you six times for the month, but then you look at your numbers and your number is at four, your number is at three and a half or three, then there's some discrepancy over there on like, why are people not getting scheduled? And it could be that they're getting scheduled and then they're canceling, right? So then we look at the cancel rate, or it could be that uh, uh, they're not buying into what you're doing and they're not booking as many sessions as you're recommending, you know? So it, those numbers are gonna allow you to start seeing, okay, where is this issue kind of like coming from? So you're, you're diagnosing, the issue, but then the numbers help you kind of like run the diagnostic test to know, okay, what is going on and how do I fix this? All right. Then uh, actually before, uh, well, no, let, let's run through the numbers and then I'll show the spreadsheets. The next one is the number of qualified leads. Okay. That's more a measurement of how well your marketing strategies are working, right? The so qualified leads are uh, people that are contacting your business through phone, email, Forms they fill out on their website, whatever it is. Uh, and qualified means that they are a good inquiry for the business, right? So, for example, uh, if someone contacts us because they found us online, but they are in a whole different state and they didn't realize that once they found their website, well, they're not a qualified lead because it's not like they can come see us, right? Does that make sense? So, qualified leads would be leads that could potentially come see you given the circumstances. And then we tie up to it the conversion percentage of leads to evaluation. So out of the inquiries that you're getting into your business, what's the percentage of those that are, are actually booking and showing up for an evaluation with you, right? The number should never be 100%. You know, it should never be 100% because if it is 100%, more likely than not, it means that you are undercharging for your services. It means that you're undercharging for a service. And there's always going to be a little bit of a healthy pushback over there. It also going to also going to depend where are those leads coming from. Okay, and I've done a training before with uh, uh, online pet health. So go back if you haven't looked at the training in the past about the different types of leads, because you're going to have a higher conversion when it's people that are coming highly recommended to you. So a veterinary referral, a client referral, uh, 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 even a word of mouth referral from a friend, family member, someone who they know and trust, and they're saying, hey, go see Francisco at the K9PT, those, those are going to convert at a higher rate, right? I know, for example, here for our business, our vet referrals, we converted about 82, 83%, word of mouth referral, client referral, even high at about 95%. But then Google leads, it goes down to like 60% or so. Why? Because, you know, it's it's a different type of lead. So go back and watch that training if you didn't. But we want to be tracking those things. So we know kind of like how efficient we are being with how we're uh, 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 having those conversations on the phone and how we're nurturing those people. 
100% should never be the goal. But also, if you're below 50%, there's also room for improvement over there. I feel a good uh, range to be at is somewhere between 50 to 65%, even up to 70% or so. Anything higher, there's something, anything lower, I mean, there's something missing. Anything higher than that, also, it could mean that you are undercharging for your services, okay? Um, what else we got over there? And then the last one is the average revenue per visit. So take the total revenue for that period of time, for that month, divide by the number of visits, and it's going to give you a range of uh, a number, an average of, okay, on average for every appointment that we see, how much in revenue are we generating? Okay, so let me show you an example here on uh, how those numbers tie up together and create sustainability and profitability with the business. So this is a revenue calculator, okay, that I share with uh, my students with the Canine PT Academy. And it's kind of nice because it allows you to play with the numbers so you can see how improving some of those numbers can have such a big impact into your business. So there on that example, the current column um, you know, let's say it's where we are today, where we see 10 evaluations a month. Our patient visit average is five, okay? So we usually send these patients maybe about once a week or something like that. Our average patient, patient span is 500. So that would mean our average cost per visit, if you go here to, to the bottom over here is $100, right? So 500 divided by five, $100. So that's uh, the, the, the average average cost per visit. Then we have, I just kept all these other numbers kind of like at a, at a numbers that it's kind of like on the lower side, but very doable, right? So the completed plan of care percentage, remember I said that ideally that should be a 90, 95%. I kept those at 80%. Eval to plan of care, I think 80% is a good number. Actually, 75, 80% is a very good number. Leads to eval percentage, which we just talked about. I just put those at 50 to keep the math simple. But that means that for every 10 evaluations that we need for that month, we need to get 20 leads, right? If we're converting it at 50%, hopefully that's easy math to do. But then you can see the revenue generated with the business. So you can see that with those numbers, if you're charging an average of $100 per session and you're seeing 10 patients a month and your PVA is 50, you can see that your revenue generated for the business is going to be about $3,200 for that month. Let's say that that's a month period right there. So that's $3,200 for the month. Okay. Now, what happens when you start tweaking some of those numbers? So here on the variable number one, the only thing I changed was the PVA. So we increased the frequency of times we see those patients to twice a week basically. So the PVA went to eight. If that's the PVA for like that month, right? The PVA went to eight and uh, everything else stayed the same, including the cost per session. So you can see we increased the revenue to 51 and some change. So increase the revenue by $1,900. Then variable number two, I kept uh, the, I went back and kept the PVA of five. So what I did was I increased the average cost per visit to 125. So you can see this, we went from 100 to 125. There was an increase in revenue of $800 compared to the initial $3,200. So an increase in revenue, but not as big as it was by increasing the PVA, right? So sometimes even though I'm big on, on, on helping you guys figure out how to charge more, sometimes that's not the only answer too. We need to look that are, are we the, uh, are we getting the most out of the patients that we have as well? Are we making sure that they're getting on the schedule and that kind of stuff, right? And then finally, what does it happen when you uh, play with those two variables at the same time? So what does it happen on variable number three? When not only you increased the PVA from five to eight, but you also increase the average cost per visit from 100 to 125. So you can see that the revenue generated went up to 6,400. So it doubled. When you look at the current, you doubled the revenue generated with your business by simply seeing the patients more often and by increasing your rates by just 25% from 100 to $125. And look at the impact that that had on, their biz on your business. While at the same time, just needing the same number of evals. So it didn't change. So it's not like, oh, I needed more patients to be able to uh, uh, generate more money. No, all you needed it 
was to be able to make sure that people were staying on your schedule and just charging a little bit, a little bit more for it. And you basically doubled your business, right? So this is why running those numbers, this is why making sure that you understand what those numbers mean and how they play a role into your business is just so important. Because hopefully you can see from that calculator that some small changes at the end of the day can have a huge impact, right? Because that double your business just for that month. Now, multiply that by three if you're looking at the quarter. Multiply that by 12 if you're looking for the year, right? And then suddenly, how would your business look today if 12 years, uh, 12 years, 12 months ago, you looked into those numbers and you came out of a plan on how to increase and how to generate more revenue by not just necessarily getting new patients, but just by making sure that you're getting more from the current patients, right? So hopefully that was helpful to you guys. And then the last category, really briefly to track, this is definitely more tied up to your marketing plan to make sure that it's working appropriately than is your lead generation system metrics. But basically tracking where are people coming from? The easiest way to do this is when you get on the phone call with them is to ask them, hey, how did you hear about us? How did you find out about us, right? And then also have this on the intake form, always have this in, in, in whatever way kind of stuff. But very important for us to know how are people finding us? I feel like these five categories are the most basic ones to track. And then depending on what you're doing with your business, you should add other categories to it, right? But online, breaking down into different categories on Google or, you know, search engines, how are people finding you online from that end? And if you do a lot of stuff on social media, how many people are finding you on social media? Then veterinary referrals, how many people are finding you through their veterinarians referring them to you? Clients, current or past clients referrals, and then just general word of mouth referral, okay? And then if you're doing other strategies, add that to it. So if you're doing a lot of community events, for example, okay, how many of our leads are coming through community events, right? If you're doing uh, an ad on a newspaper, okay, how many leads are finding us through the newsletter, right? And then you track that over a period of time and then you decide, okay, where are those leads coming from? What is working and what's not working? And understanding that there's always going to be one of those things that's going to be your primary source of referrals. Me personally, I push towards Google online being that source of referrals. I know a lot of us sometimes veterinary referrals are primary source of referrals, but no matter which one is your primary source of referral, you want ideally that to be no more than 50% of that total lead generation system, right? Because if, if you're, if you're relying even on Google, but let's say veterinary referrals, if 70% of your business is coming from veterinary referrals, that puts you in a potential precarious spot because that's 70% of your business relying on one thing. Okay. And what does it happen, especially if a lot of those veterinary referrals are coming from the same two or three places and then suddenly there's a change in those places and they don't refer out anymore. Right. Or if even... 60, 70% of your business coming through Google. What happens if suddenly your Google uh, account gets shut down for whatever reason, and then you're losing that business? So you never want to over-rely too much on one source of referral. One of them is always going to be the primary, but ideally keeping even that primary below 50% of the total would be ideal. I like, uh, 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 my goal is to have like a 40, 30, 30 splits. 40% is my primary source of referral. 30% comes from my secondary source of referral and another 30% comes from a combination of the rest of them, right? Because it's kind of like having our financial portfolio. You want to have variety. You don't want to just be investing on one stock. You don't, you just wanna, you don't want to be investing just one thing. You want to spread out to decrease the risk on your investment, okay? So hopefully that was helpful. Hopefully, I, I, it makes a little bit more sense on why we should be tracking those numbers and what numbers we should be tracking. And if you're looking for more resources, please look for our podcast, the KNIPT Academy podcast, or you can always go to our website, KNIPTacademy.com to find out more resources. Okay. All right. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I appreciate uh, Online Pet Health, Megan Kelly, and the whole team for this opportunity once again. Thank you. If you enjoyed this podcast, please hit the subscribe button so you get notified every time I load a new podcast. I'm here every week talking to vet rehab therapists from all over the world about all things vet rehab.
Don't forget to bookmark the next Vet Rehab Summit on Saturday, the 31st of August, 2024. Come and be a part of the world's largest online veterinary rehabilitation conference created specifically for you, the Vet Rehabber community. Online Pet Health members get VIP complimentary access to the Vet Rehab Summit. For more information about continuing education for vet rehabbers, you can go to onlinepethealth.com.